Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our third session. How are we all doing? Can you um, just uh, give me a quick, quick hello and let me know that the sound is coming through to you fine. Thanks, Letitia. Ali says hello. Thank you so much. Oops, I've just dropped my pen. Good. <laughs> hello, everyone. Amna says loud and clear. That's very good. Thank you so much. Brilliant. So, well, welcome, everybody. Um, I was just going through a list of uh, some of the standards we've just had a little discussion about over our first um, two sessions. And uh, we're going to have a little recap of um, something that we finished with yesterday, talking about the benefit uh, schemes, the pension schemes. Um, we're going to get more or less straight into this. Um, and I, before we do that, let me just quickly go to the Facebook page. And it's really good to see um, everybody signing up here. Some good um, good questions coming through. And I'm just going to see whether I can quickly get this up here for you. Um, because there was a question about, let's just have a quick look at this. There's a question about the impact on the financial statements. Um, whether a scheme was, uh, well, let's say a scheme is a, a DB scheme, but is incorrectly accounted for as a DC scheme. What is the impact? And there's some good comments here about obviously um, it would have an impact on the gearing and have an impact on the shape of the profit and loss. So some really, really good um, thoughts going on here. Um, and I, you may want to go and have a look at that. The second thing, of course, is that I've put the link up for our second session. There is the uh, the Vimeo uh, video there for us. So please, uh, if we can, let's go back and have a look at um, those. So let me get back to here and let me go back to here, everybody. Um, got lots of people saying hello. Hello, everybody. It is really, really good that you are all here. and. Um, Thank you so much again for everybody's uh, interaction um, as we go through our time together. What I've done, everybody, is um, let me just move this across here a little bit. What I've done is to just just um, put down again in a slightly neater fashion, I hope, the what I call the pro forma, what we generally call the pro forma for the uh, the present value of the obligation for the DB scheme and for the scheme asset, just so that you can maybe see it a little bit uh, clearer. And of course, remember, as we were saying yesterday, there is a fundamental difference between the DC scheme and the DB scheme. And this is largely to do, largely to do with the recognition of the obligation. Now, here's a here's a quick question for you then, please. And, and let's see whether we can get, um, get the answer to this one. Um, let me ask you this question. For a DC scheme, when is the obligation extinguished for a DC scheme? For the entity, for a DC scheme, when is the obligation extinguished? Does that make any sense? For a DC scheme, a defined contribution scheme, when is the entity's obligation extinguished? Amna says when it's paid, when what is paid? When is the obligation extinguished with respect to a DC scheme? And I think I know what you mean here. I, so Tasneen is saying when, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Right, Bicky, I'm just gonna come back to your point. Okay, let's let's clarify this, please. Let's clarify. Remember the principle within IS19 for any, any employee benefit. Let me just get the, uh, the question up here again for Kate, if I can, as we are highlighting this yesterday. The principle, the overriding principle for anything within IS19 on employee benefits is that the entity recognizes that obligation as the employee provides service to the entity. Now, remember with a defined contribution scheme, defined contribution scheme, the expense for the any year is the contributions payable, not the contributions paid, but the contributions payable. That, of course, means that the entity's obligation is extinguished. They have no further obligation once that's agreed, once that agreed level of, of uh, contributions for the year has been paid. It's as simple as that. So if the entity agrees to pay 6% of salary in a separate scheme, then once that 6% has been paid across in any 
individual year, then the entity has no obligation, no further obligation. So it is, it is extinguished, it is settled, there is no further obligation for that year once the contributions have been paid into the scheme. Does that make sense? Are we okay with that? Are we happy with that point? Let's just check on that. So with a DC scheme, the entity's obligation is extinguished. They have no further obligation. As soon as they've paid across the agreed level of contributions into the scheme for any one year. Fajana says yes. Now, here is a question then, everybody. When is the obligation settled for a defined benefit scheme? When is the obligation settled or when is the obligation extinguished for a defined benefit scheme? What do you think about that? When does the obligation get extinguished or when does the obligation get settled for a defined benefit scheme? What are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on that? Just give me your thoughts, please, on that. For a defined benefit scheme, when does the obligation get settled? When does the obligation get settled? And Tasnini is saying when the defined amount is paid to the employee. Well, that sounds pretty good when the level of benefit and uh, Amna is saying when the level of the benefit fund matches the total agreed to be paid. That also sounds uh, very, very good. Bicky says when the employee retires and is paid out. Well, let's think about this, please. Let's think about this. What if I said this to you? When does the obligation finally, finally get settled? When does the entity finally have no further obligation for a defined benefit scheme? That's maybe a better way of asking the question, please. For the entity with a defined benefit scheme, when is there effectively no further obligation? What do you think about that? What would you say about that? For the entity, for a defined benefit scheme, when in reality does the entity have no further obligation? And for genre is saying when the employee passes on. Vicky is saying when the employee dies, question mark. And to be honest, uh, let's see, uh, Katharina, Katharina is saying when there's no more employees. Well, let's think about the logic of that because I think your answers are all correct. You imagine that there are 10,000 employees within a defined benefit scheme. The entity has got an obligation to pay them a pension based upon average final salary, based upon years of service, and the employee is entitled to receive that pension from the point at which they retire to really the point at which they pass on. So arguably, arguably with a defined benefit scheme, the obligation only ceases to exist, only ceases to exist. Yes, of course, when the obligation equates to the assets, but in reality, the entity has no further obligation only when there are no employees left within the scheme. When there are no employees left within the scheme. And of course, typically, that is never going to occur because employees will join, employees will leave, new employees will join the scheme. But in reality, of course, that is the basic point. It is an obligation that effectively only ceases when the employees leave the scheme. And you would expect that the real time when they leave the scheme is when they pass on. Does that does that make some sort of sense? Because if it does, you'll start to see the significant difference between DC and DB. And of course, as you have, some of you have mentioned on the Facebook page, it is quite clear that with a DB scheme, the risk is primarily with the employer, whereas with a DC scheme, the investment risk and what we call the actuarial risk is primarily with the employee. So with a DB scheme, more of the risk, if not all of the risk is with the employer, Whereas with a DC scheme, the risk is primarily with the employee in terms of what will be that benefit, how that benefit will be funded. These are important, important um, things to uh, think about. OK, so um, that's a very, very important point. And remember, the pro form is here. And as I was suggesting yesterday, 
obviously in a question you might see these proformers are combined remember please that these proformers are no more no less than a replication of how the nominal ledger account for a db scheme is constructed okay and one more thing i was going to say to you is remember that the only cash flow the only cash flow for the entity is the contributions paid out each year everything else is either a charge or a credit to pnl and or OCI. Remember with the DC scheme there's basically one expense and that expense is the contributions payable. With the DB scheme it is far more complicated because of that whole point about the liability for each year is primarily made up based upon a variety of very very complicated assumptions uh, really in general uh, determined by the actuary. Now what I'd like to do, please, is to start moving away from uh, this issue and to get us to start to think about the issue of consolidation, the issue of group accounting, however you want to uh, call it. Now, let us reiterate something, please, from our first session today. First, I apologize, our first session on Tuesday, two days ago. Please remember that there is a fundamental difference between how consolidation will be examined in SBR compared to how it was examined under P2. Some of the questions that you asked me yesterday on the Facebook page were, is it likely to see, could we have a requirement to prepare a cash flow statement in the SBR exam? Well, I ask, could we have the, re the requirement to prepare a balance sheet or a P&L? And the answer to that is the same as I actually put down on uh, the page yesterday, the chance of you having to prepare a full statement is pretty, pretty close to zero. So I think we can take it as read that you will not have to be preparing a full balance sheet and or a PL or a cash flow in your exam next week. That is not now the shape, that is not now the focus of the examiner's um, concerns, if you like, in terms of us being able to demonstrate an understanding of the issues, the principles revolving around consolidation. And that's what we're going to start to do um, this afternoon. OK, now I'm going to ask you uh, a few questions as we start our little journey here. And I'm going to put up a, a little scenario here and we've got I'm going to give you the situation where A is investing in B. OK, A is investing in B. A is buying shares in B. And I want us to think about, please, this. If I said to you that um, in year one, in year one, A acquired 10 percent of the equity shares of B in year one, if A acquired 10 percent of the equity shares of B, how would A treat that investment in B? What accounting standard would come to mind? How would A account for that 10% that it has in B? What do you think about that, please? Yeah, what do you think about that? So, for Jean is saying a, a financial asset. Yeah. Crystal is saying IFRS 9. Mohammed saying IFRS 9. Equity accounting. Well, yeah, I'm going to repeat the question. So A is investing in B, and in year one, A acquires 10% of the shares, the equity shares of B. And my question to you, everybody, is how do you think that A will account for that investment in B? What, what accounting standard do you think comes to mind? And a lot of you are saying a financial asset, and a lot of you are saying uh, IFRS 9. OK, all right, I'm going to leave that there. And then I'm going to say this. What about in if in let's see if I get the pen to work. What about if in year two, A acquired a further 10 percent in B? Yeah. So, of course, cumulatively, it is now got 20 percent of the equity in B. What do you think now? What do you think now? So Tasneen is saying associate. Haroon is saying an associate. Kudzi is still saying still IFRS 9. Amna is saying associate. A lot of you are saying associate. 
a lot of you saying associate here. OK. All right. Well, let's expand this and let's say, what about if in year three they acquire a further 10 percent? So now they've got a cumulative investment of 30 percent. What 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 do you think is going to be the relevant accounting now for that investment from year three? And a lot of you are now saying associate very clearly you're saying associate yes you're coming up with this very very clearly now you're saying that's a definite are you are you definitely sure that's associate are you really really sure that is an associate because he's saying yes because he's saying move on move on of course it's an associate <laughs> what about then year four what about and i think you can know you know where this is heading let's see whether i get the pen to work again year four they acquire a further 30 percent and so now we're dealing with cumulatively 60 percent cumulatively 60 percent now what do you think is going to be the um the relevant accounting here what do you think is going to be the relevant mm. regina says uh subsidiary tasnin says subsidiary uh so can you give me any relevant accounting standards here please what do you think are the the relevant accounting standards here for us so I'm seeing IFRS 10, I'm seeing IFRS 3. Yes, I'm seeing IFRS 10, very, very good. Very, very good. Okay, let's continue this, please. I think you're, you're, you're coming up with some good points here. Let's say in year five, there is a further 10%. There is a further 10%. So we've now got 70%. We now have 70% or A has 70%. Is it still the same? Is it still, is it still? Do you, are you still going to come up with the same, the same? Yes. Yeah. OK, so you're saying in year five, in year four, we we have a subsidiary company uh, and we still have a subsidiary company. OK. All right. So let's let's think about this, please. In year six, let's say there is a uh, we go down by 30 percent. OK, 30 percent. We go down by 30 percent. So let's take this down to 40 percent. OK, what do you think now? What do you think now? So Harun is saying, well, we'll assume, oh, Bassett is saying, we'll assume we dispose of 30 percent associate. Oh, I'm going to come back to that. Tasneen is yes. And OK, OK, OK. So you're saying now associate. Now, I really, really, really love your responses here. I really, really love your responses now. Let us start this little discussion all over again, because oh, I've got a lot of I've got a lot of people saying associate, and I'm I'm pretty happy uh, with your response here. But I'm going to say this: I'm pretty happy, but not necessarily a hundred percent happy. And let's think about why not. Now, if I said to you, what is the shareholding that gives associate status? There's a question for you, please. If I said to you, what is the shareholding that gives associate status? What figure are you going to give to me? What figure are you going to give to me? If you wanted to respond, if I asked you for the shareholding that it gives us associate status, what is that shareholding? Amnada is saying 20, 20 to 50 percent. Amnada is saying 25 percent, above 25 percent. Katarina is saying 20% or 20% of the board. OK, so I'm seeing a lot of this 20%. And of course, I am I am assuming, I am thinking that that is actually what you are going to tell me. Now, let me say this, please, to you. Remember in our exam, in the same way that remember in the real world, in the world that we are advising, we are not going to assume. In fact, what IS 28, of course, the standard for accounting for associates and joint ventures, what IS 28 does say, of course, that it is presumed that an associate status will be there for shareholdings of 20 percent or more. Now, notice the word presumption. That is not the same as fact. There is a presumption that you will have an associate, you will have significant influence 
at shareholdings of 20% or more. But of course, we need to consider other indicators. So if you like, that 20% threshold, that 20% threshold is just one of a number of indicators. Because remember, in order for you to have an associate, you have to be able to exercise significant influence. So if I'm holding 20%, but are not able to influence anything, I'm not so sure that I actually do have an associate. Does that make sense, everybody? 20% is seems to me to be an indicator of significant influence, but it's not the same as fact. I want to be looking at the facts. So I want to see whether I have representation on the board. I want to see whether there are material transactions between my entity and the other entity. I want to see whether there are transfer of key personnel between the two entities. I want to see that in reality, we have got more of a strategic relationship between the two entities rather than these just being two standalone entities. So as I always want to think about, I am not going to assume, I want to look at the facts of the situation. So let me go back and clarify, please. I want you to remember that what IS-28 says is, yes, there is a presumption that significant influence does exist at shareholdings of 20% or more, but we need to consider other indicators. Some of you have mentioned them, like board representation, the, the ability to vote within the boardroom. Some of you talked about these transactions, material transactions between different entities, between the two entities, I should say. The transfer of, of uh, key information, the transfer of senior personnel between the two entities. These are all indicators of, of significant influence existing. So let me ask you this, please. Is it possible to have significant influence at shareholdings below 20%? What do you think about that, please? Is it possible to have right now yes of course it is right and so yes it is and in reality the, the answer to that question is well it depends it depends whether or not the entity is able to exercise significant influence because the figure of 20 percent is merely an indicator do you see that yes indeed it depends these are good 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 answers now please just I'm a little concerned that the audio is too loud here. Can you just give me a, a quick yes or no? Is the audio okay with everybody? Because I don't want to be shouting at you. Is, the, is it okay? Good, 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 good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Okay. You're, you're fantastic at responding. You're so quick on the keyboards, everyone. Now, let me, let me go through this again, because what I want you to be looking at, what I want you to be looking at is the same as I've wanted you to look at through our time together so far. Don't assume, don't assume, don't assume, okay? So is it possible to have significant influence if I had 5%? Is it possible to have significant influence? Is it possible to have an associate if I only own 5%? Yes, it is, yes, it is. Let me ask you this, everybody. Could I have a situation where I own 30% but don't have an associate? Is that possible? Is it possible for me to own 30% but not have an associate? Is that? Yes, it is. It is because, remember, 20% is merely an indicator. I have to demonstrate that I have what we call a participating interest. I have to demonstrate that I am able to exercise significant influence. Okay? So if I have 30%, but I clearly can demonstrate that I don't have some influence, I don't have a participating interest, then I will not treat the investment as an associate. So let me reiterate, IS-28 assumes there is a presumption, I should say, within IS-28 that a shareholding of 20% or more does give significant influence. Therefore, if you have a shareholding of 30%, you need to demonstrate that you do not have significant influence, and if you have if you have a shareholding of less than 20 percent, then you've got to demonstrate that you do have significant influence. Does that does that make sense? And what I want you to be thinking about, please, primarily as we go through this is question, question, be inquisitive and do not assume when you see percentages. All right. So if I give you a percentage of 19.99 percent, 
Well, you could say on the face of it that, that that appears not to give significant influence. However, there could be other things going on like board representation that do give significant influence and therefore it would be an associate. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Let's think everybody, yes. Let's think. Now, let's think about this please. Let's give this. Is it possible to have a subsidiary company? Is it possible to have a subsidiary company if A only owns 20% of the equity share capital of B? Let's, let me give you that again. Is it possible for A to have B as a subsidiary? Is it possible for A to have a subsidiary in B if it only owns 20%? I'm going to say to you, just think about it. And Crystal is saying, if there is control. Kudzi is saying no. Crystal is saying if there is control. Jordan is saying, Jordan is saying yes. Let me go through this again, please, because what I want you to think about is as we as we look again at this, as we look again at this, I want us to be thinking about the reality of the situation. So my question is, would it ever be possible to a, for A to have B as a subsidiary company if it only owns 20 percent of the equity share capital of B? And the answer to that is, well, yes, it is possible. Yes, it is possible. And I, it is possible if A has control of B, control of the net assets of B. And it is important, please, it is important at this level of examination to move away from this thought process that we only have a subsidiary company once we own 51%. That's what sometimes what we're used to thinking about. So is it possible to have a subsidiary company if you own 20 percent? Yes, it is. 30 percent? Yes, it is. 40 percent? Yes, it is. 52 percent? Yes, it is. 70 percent? Yes, it is. Because it's not based on ownership. It is based on control. Now, are we happy with what I've just said there in terms of a subsidiary company? Having a subsidiary company is based on having control rather than just ownership. Are you happy with that thought process, please? OK, right now. I'm I am happy. I'm just going to move this up here now. Of course, I'm, well, I'm, I was going to write this down, but I'm going to ask you yet another question. Does anybody know the accounting standard where we get the definition of a subsidiary from? i.e. do we know the standard that tells us whether or not we do have a subsidiary company? Yes, IFRS 10. OK, it seems that you're right. Now, let's write this down. So IF, oops, let's get the pen working. Please work. Why are you not working? So the standard, of course, is IFRS 10, Consolidated Financial Statements, Consolidated Financial Statements. Good. And all I want you to be thinking about is this. I'm going to give you the definition. IFRS 10, listen, listen carefully, please, to this. IFRS 10 states that control arises when the acquirer, when the acquirer, in this case it will be A, is exposed or has rights to the variable returns of the acquiree, that will be in this situation, that will be B, and has the ability to affect those returns through the power it has over the acquiree. OK, let's let me give you that again. So control. Listen carefully, please, to this definition. Control arises when the acquirer is exposed or has rights to the variable returns of the acquiree and has the ability to affect those returns through the power it has over the acquiree. Now, if you listen to that definition, you will see nowhere within that definition does it mention, oh, and by the way, that means that ownership has to be greater than 50%. It doesn't say that because the key, of course, is to do with control. 
Do you or do you not have control? If you have control, then you have a subsidiary company. If you do not have control, then you do not have a subsidiary company. And it's all based upon the principle of having the power, of having the ability to affect these returns, affect the profit or losses that are coming from the investment that you have in this other entity. That is the principle that we are concerned about. OK, so let's go back to a typical situation and let's think about this, please. If I said to you that, again, let's hopefully get the pen to work here. Oh, I don't know why the pen is not working. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. OK, right. So let's go back to this situation where A has got an investment in B. And to avoid any complications here, let's assume that they've now got a 60 percent interest in B. And it is an interest that, well, I suppose logically gives control. OK, so what happens then, everybody? If A, if A acquires a, oh, I don't know what's going on here at all. If A acquires a further 10%, if A acquires a further 10% in B, what's going on here? Does A gain more control? If A acquires 60% and effectively has control, if A acquires a further 10%, does A gain more control? Sikander is saying yes, there's a strengthening of control. So Sikander is saying yes. I'm just saying no. Let's think about this, please. So what I'm saying to you here is that A has acquired 60% of B, and I'm going to say to you that it is an investment that gains control over B. And then A acquires a further 10%. Does that give A more control? And I think the answer to that has got to be no. How can you get more control if you've already got control? So control is either a yes, I have control or no, I do not have control. Yes, I have a subsidiary company. Uh, I lose control. No, I do not have a subsidiary company. So, of course, what this does instead is to give A more ownership of the net assets in B. And of course, what is happening here is let's see whether the pen is going to work. This is a little bit strange. Let's think about the 40 percent here. Let's think about this 40 percent. Who owns that 40 percent when A has 60 percent? Who owns that 40 percent when A owns 60 percent? Very good, everybody. Of course, it's the NCI. So who now is owning 30% as we own 70%. It, of course, is still the NCI. And now what you're doing is quite clearly stating that there is no change in control. There's nothing fundamentally happening here. There is merely a shift in the ownership of the net assets of B between the group, the parent company A, and the NCI. And, of course, typically what we do is we call this a step up situation where we step up from 60% to 70% and the NCI steps down from 40% to 30%. Yes, George Jody is saying it's a transfer between owners. And that is a, a very, very, very uh, common situation for examination at this level. It was under P2 and it's likely to be the same under SPR. Can you see that, please? There is no change in control. We had control. We still have control. Once you have control, you cannot gain more control. You can only have a change in ownership. I think that seems to be something that you are fairly, fairly happy with. Good. So let me go back here. Let me go back here before we start looking at a, a little question. And I'm going to go back here, please. And I'm going to say in year one, in year one, if A acquires 10 percent in B, what's the relevant accounting standard? If A acquires 10 percent of B in year one, what's the relevant accounting standard? And don't 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 just don't just come in straight away. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. And I think your answer should be, well, it depends. It depends whether that 10% gives control, which 
might be unlikely. Whether that 10% gains significant influence, which is a possibility, which need to demonstrate that, or if there's no control or no significant influence, then of course it is merely an investment in an equity instrument that would be, of course, IFRS 9. Do you see what I'm getting at here, everybody? I'm trying to get you into the mindset of looking through and sifting through the narrative so that we don't assume and therefore make a, a, a basically a wrong assumption. Because what I want to know is more of the detail that is going on. So if we get to year three and we've now got 30% in B, what is the relevant accounting treatment here for year three? What is the relevant accounting treatment for year three? Is it going to be IFRS 9? Is it going to be IS 28? Or is it? Yes, it depends. Right. That's it, of course. And I know logically it is likely to be an associate and I don't disagree with you there. But the real the real thought process has to be it depends. Yes, it depends. And I need to have more information to determine whether I have significant influence or whether I have control or whether I have nothing. Brilliant, everybody. And that, of course, is the same answer as, hey, I've got a pension scheme here. Is it DC or DB? I've got to, I've got to account for a pension scheme. Is it DC or DB? What are you going to say? You're going to say, well, it depends. Yes, it depends. I, if I said to you, I've got a property here, is it PPE or is it an investment property? What's your answer? It's going to be, it depends. Do you see what I'm getting at here? Yes, it depends. And it's that thought process, everybody, that takes us into the mindset of an inquisitive strategic business reporter and gets us into the mindset for our exam. Very, very good, everybody. Now, let us start having a look, please. I'm going to just move up the pages here and I'm going to go on to a question that you have got available to you today. And let me expand this out, everybody. Um, and I'm just gonna move a little, the question answer screen here. You can't see sometimes the things I'm moving around here, but so I'll talk you through it. Now, this question, this question is a question that we are going to have a little bit of a look at in the time we've got this afternoon. And we're gonna look at another question as well. And some of you may be familiar with this question already. So I actually put it up on the Facebook page earlier on, and it's a question you've got available to you today. Now, let me explain, please. This is the question, the consolidation question from the P2 exam from December 2011. That's quite a few years ago. That's quite a few years ago. And I'm going to take you to the requirements for this question, which is a classic, a classic P2 question. And it is a question, a requirement to prepare a consolidated statement of financial position for the Traveller Group for the year ended the 30th of November 2017. I brought to this up to date, so I've amended the dates. Now, my question to you, everybody, is this. My question to you is this. Will you see a question like this in your SBR exam a week today? What's your answer to that, please? Will you see a question like this? <laughs> uh, and I think... Most of you, is, nope, right, right, highly unlikely. Yes, yes, right, okay, very, very good. Now, I think the chance of it is incredibly remote, and I'm not thinking of the, the uh, IS 37 here in terms of degrees of possibility, but please think about this. We said on uh, two days ago that question one will remain the consolidation question. It will remain the consolidation question, question one, but remember, it is going to be about discussion, possibly backed up by calculations, rather than just a straight prepare question, okay? And one of the things I made, uh, I said to you on Tuesday, was that the marks available for calculations to do with consolidation will be a very, very maximum of, does anybody remember the, the figure? A very, very maximum of how many marks? for the calculation element. Very good, everybody, 25. Now, I actually would say to you, I think in reality, it's likely to be a lot less than that. I think it's likely to be a lot less than 25 marks. And remember that we do not know whether question one will be for 20 marks, 25 marks, 30 marks. All we know is that the two questions within section A will total up to 50 marks overall. 
Okay. Now, what I'm going to do, everybody, is this. I'm going to go into this question and I'm going to put it on the edit mode. And bear with me, please, because I've just got to go to my laptop. So the sound's going to go for a little bit. But just I'm going to do this. See what you think about this. See what you think about this. Discuss with suitable calculations how the consolidated state of the financial position for the traveller group da, 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 should be prepared. Okay, discuss. Oh, all of a sudden, does that look like a different question, everybody? Discuss with suitable calculations. Let me put a, another uh, comma in here. Discuss with suitable calculations how the consolidated statement of financial position for the traveller group. Does that does that look a different question? Well, it should do in a way because the emphasis, of course, is now on the discussion. It's the same question, obviously, but what I'm doing is we're moving. We are moving to explanation of what is going on within the question. Okay. Now. Let me make this clear, please. Let me make this clear. The chances are, the chances are that within your exam, you will be asked to explain parts of the consolidation. This, not, not the degree that we've got here, not the degree that we've got here. I'm using this as an exercise for us, please. So I don't want you to be, you know, sort of overly concerned by the, by the degree of narrative here. The question you're likely to see in the exam will revolve around a discussion, maybe with suitable calculations to do with part of the consolidation process. So it may be to do with, for example, a calculation of an explanation, I should say, of a goodwill calculation or an explanation as to what happens when we go from 60 percent to 70 percent or an explanation of what happens if we go from 60 percent to 40 percent or an explanation of how the retained earnings working is is calculated or an explanation as to the difference between the the policy for the NCI being fair value as opposed to the policy for the NCI being proportionate. Now, can you see what I'm getting at here? Can you see what I'm, I'm suggesting? There is, a, there is a big shift here between a, a, a statement, a question that is requiring you to prepare the final statement, as opposed to a question that is asking you to discuss, sometimes backed up with numbers, sometimes not, elements of the consolidation process, okay? Now, can you give me a, a quick yes or no, please? Because I want you to be happy with this as we go through. Now, I do not believe that you are going to have a 35 mark question that is basically explain how the consolidated statement of financial position is prepared. What I've done here, what I've done here is just to get you into the mindset, please to hopefully get you into the mindset that what you're looking for in question one is to be able to demonstrate that you understand the principles of the consolidation process itself. You will not be preparing that full statement, P&L, balance sheet, cash flow. OK, so if I go back here, you may be asked to explain what happens when we go from 60 percent to 70 percent and possibly back it up by numbers that of course is now a significant a significant change from p2 so that's what i want us to be looking at for uh, this afternoon and i'm going to elaborate on this as well and, and some of you um, have possibly already uh, looked at the specimen exam papers and i and i hope you have and i'm going to um, flag them up to you there i've got them here Let's go across here. There are two specimen exam papers, and I'm going to make sure that you um, are fully aware of those before we conclude uh, tomorrow. But you'll see you'll see exactly the the, the shape of um, the question one within those. But I want to um, I want to look at something here because I don't want you to I don't want you to think, please, that question one is just all about the consolidation. Because let's think about this. 
we've got four note four note five and note six here which was in the original p2 question and the chances are that still within question one of the SPR, it will include not only a discussion requirement or a requirement to discuss elements of consolidation, but it will also it will also require a discussion, possibly with calculations to do with other accounting issues. OK, so let me ask you again, please. Are you happy with what I'm saying there? That question one is not just about consolidation, but it will be about other accounting issues as well. Good. All right, everybody. Good. Now, very, very good. Very, very good. Now, let me just go back to this here. And I just want to, if I can get my pen to work here, just let me edit uh, i want to basically just highlight this point here to you discuss 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 and please i want you to be happy with the fact that sometimes you will need to back it up with calculations and sometimes you won't it depends it depends on basically the requirements now before we start looking at this in a little bit more detail i want you please to be um happy or happier with something I've suggested to you before. You've got three hours, 15 minutes for this exam. It is imperative, it is so important, please, that you do not rush. It is important that you do not rush your starting point to this exam. I want you to be really, really concerned about proper planning for your questions and really make sure you read through the requirements that are in front of you, okay? so. Let us, before we look at the group elements here, please, um, I'm just going to get us to read through note four. Now, remember, this is part of this original question, and I want us to, to think about this, please. Included, it says here, let's read this through together. Included in the financial assets of Traveller is a 10-year 7% loan. At the 30th of November 2017, the borrower was in financial difficulties and its credit rating had been downgraded. Traveller has adopted IFRS 9 and the loan asset is currently held at amortized cost of $29 million. Traveller now wishes to value the loan at fair value using current market interest rates. Traveller has agreed for the loan to be restructured. There will only be three more annual payments of $8 million starting in one year's time. Current market interest rates are 5%. The original effective interest rate is 6.7% and the effective interest rate under the revised payment schedule is 6.3. Any loss allowance previously recognized relating to the asset is considered to be material. Now, I have adjusted this slightly, but I want you to be aware that this is the sort of issue that could appear anywhere within your exam, section A or section B, but it could appear within this consolidation question one as an accounting issue in the same way that it did within the P2 exam. And I just want us to focus in on this for a few minutes. And the first thing I want to uh, just ask you is this, please. We've got a 10-year 7% loan. Traveller has adopted IFRS 9 and it is currently held at amortised cost. Now, remember, the asset is going to be measured at amortized cost if the business model is to hold to collect the contractual cash flows and those contractual cash flows are solely interest and principal. That's what we talked about the other day. Now, it says here, Traveller now wishes to, let me get my uh, little ruler out here and just underline this if you can find it. Traveller now wishes to value the loan. Let's see whether I can annotate this. Traveller now wishes to value the loan at fair value using current market interest rates. Tell me this, please. Tell me this. Can Traveller now switch from measuring the loan asset, the financial asset, from amortised cost to fair value? And it doesn't matter whether it's fair value through PL or fair value through OCI for this question. Is it possible for Traveller to now reclassify this loan from amortized cost to fair value. And you could say yes, no, you could say it depends. I just want 
right for John is saying it depends and now remember what we said the other day when does IFRS 9 allow you to change the classification when does IFRS 9 allow you to change the classification and I'm just saying it is only possible if the business model changes if the business model right this is what you're saying very very good very very good right brilliant everybody you are so brilliant at this you're thinking through now here is the point does it say anywhere within this note that the business model has changed does it say anywhere that the objective for holding the asset has changed no it doesn't and so therefore therefore it seems to me that this asset must remain at being measured at amortized cost okay now Let's think about this, please. Let's think about this. Why would you want to change the classification from amortized cost to fair value? Could there be some sort of ethical issue going on here as well? If you're wanting to change the classification when you basically know it can't change. Yes. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking this. It's a let's see what my pen is going to work here. It's a 7% loan. But current market rates of interest are only 5%. Hmm, that's interesting to me because surely if the bond that I'm holding is giving me 7%, but market interest rates have dropped to 5%, that would seem to me that the fair value of my bond is going to go up. My bond surely is worth more now because it's paying, it's paying more than the market, the current market rate of interest. That seems to me to be one reason why you might want to change the classification the measurement now let me take this away whoops let me take this away and let us go back to this remember remember that the business model has to change in order for you to reclassify the asset now as we see here there is no classification possible there is no classification possible reclassification possible because there has been no change in the business model therefore it must remain at amortized cost now remember this please you might recall that ifrs 9 talks about the expected credit loss model and talks about the fact that we have to move or we look at the asset on day one as having a a, a loss allowance and we move from stage one possibly to stage two if there is a significant increase in credit risk and then we move to stage three if there is actually indication of credit impairment itself and of course the point is that here because the borrower is now in financial difficulties and its credit rating had been downgraded does it now look as if this bond is actually credit impaired what do you think everybody do you think it now looks as if this bond is now credit impaired Yes, it does. And of course, what we are now going to do, what we are now going to do is to calculate the size of the impairment in accordance with IFRS 9. And obviously, if the bond is impaired, then we are going to reduce the carrying amount of the bond and charge the loss to the retained earnings. And of course, if there was a loss allowance to begin with, which of course it says here is immaterial. If there was a, a loss allowance to begin with, then the loss would be charged first of all to the loss allowance and then any excess loss to retained earnings. And some of you are saying here, well, it appears therefore that the bond is now in stage three. Stage one, the 12 month loss allowance, stage two, the lifetime loss allowance, if there's been a significant increase in credit risk and stage three, if there is actually indications of credit impairment. Now, Without going through this in too much detail, please, this is exactly my point, because here what you will be doing is you'll be discussing what is going on here in terms of it's not possible to reclassify the bond because there is no change in business model. And as the bond has to remain within amortized cost, we now have to calculate the size of any impairment because there is clear indication that the asset is credit impaired and is therefore at stage three of the ECL model. And remember, please remember that if you or when you are calculating any impairment losses under IFRS 9, then you calculate uh, the impairment loss as the difference between the carrying amount and the present value of the expected future cash flows discounted using the original effective interest rate. 
there's quite a lot there's quite a lot in this question that you could find within any any place within the exam now what i want you to do please is what i'm trying to emphasize here is again your exam is primarily is based fundamentally upon discussion sometimes backed up with numbers sometimes not let's have a look at the second point here please or point number five traveler acquired a new factory on the 1st of december 2016 the cost of the factory was 50 million and it has a residual value of 2 million the factory has a flat roof which needs replacing every five years the cost of the roof was five million dollars the useful economic life of the factory is 25 years. No depreciation has been charged for the year. Traveller wishes to account, oh, I'm going to underline that. Traveller wishes to account for the factory and roof as a single asset. Let me underline that there, if I can with my, as a single asset and depreciate the whole factory over its economic life, presumably of 25 years. What do you think to that? Is that possible, everybody? Is that possible to treat this factory as a, as a single asset? Hmm. And you're saying no, you're saying no, and I'm going to ask you therefore, and therefore I'm going to ask you what should they do? What should they do? And as I ask you this question, everybody, I want you to think about some of the, just think about what comes into your head, what comes into your mind as I ask you, is it possible to treat this as a single asset? And Vicky, you're saying depreciate um, separately good right mariam is saying component accounting so let's think about let's think about this because remember that is 16 talks about complex assets and a complex asset is one that is made up of many different or several different components each of those components having its own useful life the principle here the principle is that each component needs to be charged to the profit and loss over its own relevant useful life period. And so therefore, when we have got a, a, com a complex asset, we for accounting purposes need to break it down into the various components and depreciate each component according to its own useful life. Does that make sense? And I think you're saying, yes, it does. Very, very good. And of course, um, Regina is saying here, there's an ethical, could there be an ethical problem? And of course, with all of these things, with all of these things, when there is something going on that doesn't actually look quite right, there is potentially an ethical situation. Now, remember that primarily you're going to be looking to question two for that, which we will have a look at tomorrow. OK, but it doesn't mean to say that it won't be elsewhere within the paper. So all of the time you are looking out for what the question is asking you and you are, you are really, really, really honing in on issues within the question and the wording of that question. So now let me ask you this, please. What is the principle to do with depreciation? Is, is there a way you can quickly respond to me there? What's, let me put it another way, please. Is depreciation anything to do with value? Is depreciation to do with value? Is depreciation to do with value? I'm just saying yes. Crystal's saying no. Bicky's saying yes. Let me ask you again, please. Is depreciation anything to do with value? Is depreciation anything to do with value? Jody is saying no. Tasneen's saying yep. Well, I'm going to say actually, I don't think it is. I think the principle behind depreciation is to allocate the cost of the asset or allocate the cost of the component of the asset to the profit and loss over those periods which are expected to generate the benefit, the economic benefit from that asset or from that component. It is an allocation of cost technique. Revaluation is to do with value, but depreciation is to do with the allocation of cost. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Right. It's the principle. Notice I'm saying again, please, the word principle. The principle is to allocate the cost. That is what depreciation is about. That is what amortization is about over the useful life of 
the asset or the component of that asset, right? That's what I want us to be thinking about here, please, because that is the whole essence of this point here. No, traveler needs to recognize the asset based upon the two components because the two components have different useful lives and therefore the depreciation, i.e. the allocation of the cost of those components needs to be needs to be on the basis of the life that is expected from those components. Very, very good. Now, let's uh, we're not going to go uh, too far down these lines, but let's just have a look at note six, please. And let's read this together. The actuarial value of Traveller's pension plan showed a surplus of the 1st of December 2016 of 72 million. Let's look at that. Oh, there it is. There is the 72 million. There it is in the balance sheet. Let me. There it is. There's a 72 million at the beginning of the year. The aggregate of the current service cost. Interest cost and interest income on assets amounted to a net cost of 55 million. So that is effectively uh, a, a charge to uh, retained earnings. After consulting with the actuaries, the company decided to reduce its contributions for the year to 45 million. The contributions were paid on the 7th of December 2017. The no entries have been made in the financial statements at the year end. Oh, look at this, everybody. At the year end, the actuarial losses were 25 million and the present value and the present value of the available future refunds and reductions in contributions was $18 million. Please tell me, what, what's another way of explaining that $18 million at the year end? What is that $18 million? What's the, what's the definition of that $18 million? And you're saying asset ceiling, and I agree with you entirely. And remember, please, remember that we can never have a situation where the the surplus within the scheme is greater than the asset ceiling. So it needs to be impaired. It needs to be impaired. It needs to be written down to the asset ceiling of $18 million. And so interestingly, everybody, if we go to note four, that is to do with impairments, not IFRS 36, but IFRS 9. If we go to note six, that is also to do with impairments that not within IS 36, but IS 19, we cannot overstate our assets. So that figure of 18 million, that figure of 18 million is the asset ceiling. OK, now here we've got a defined benefit scheme. If you're asked to discuss, then, of course, you discuss how uh, the current service cost and interest cost would be accounted for in terms of, a, if you like, a net increase in the liability and a charge to retained earnings. And notice, please, this. Notice, please, this. The contributions were paid on the 7th of December 2017. Is that after the year end? Is that after the year end? Because the year end is, the, yes, it seems to me that it is after the year end. Now, would you include those within your computations? Would you include those within the computations? Yes or no? Hmm, interesting. Because remember what we wrote down here, what we wrote down, what we wrote down here is contributions contributions paid yeah contributions paid now be a little bit careful here please because the contributions were paid it's just that they were paid late so i would be quite happy to explain that we bring the contributions into our calculations and reflect it as a short term accrual because in actual fact this is looking like just an administrative issue because clearly the contributions were were paid now notice the difference please if i change the question and said the contributions were not paid on time because of cash flow problems is there a difference the contributions were not paid on time because of cash flow problems. Is there a difference there? Is there a difference? Yes, there is. And what I'm looking for in a scenario to do with a defined benefit scheme is this situation where contributions have not been paid because of cash flow issues. Because this is a way what companies would do in the past is they would bring in the contributions, even though they'd not been paid, and recognize them as an accrual. And it was a way of manipulating the liability in terms of overstating or understating, I should say, the liability, net liability, or overstating the scheme assets. So again, it's something I want you to be, to be aware of, please. If the contributions have not been paid 
because of cash flow problems, then they clearly cannot be included within any calculations. But if they've just been paid slightly late because of maybe here a, just a problem in raising the check on time, then I don't have so much a problem in bringing the contributions in and recognizing the other side as a short-term accrual. That again is just a thinking or a thought process and not assuming that just because what you've seen before is always necessarily the case. That is really no different from saying, hey, I always assume, I always assume that 51% is the level that gives us subsidiary status. I need to think everybody. Now, before we have a break, we are going to look at this part here. And I want us to think about this, please. Let's read. Let's read the first part of this question. Let's read this part of the question together. On the 1st of December 2016, and our year end is the 30th of November 2017, Traveller acquired 60% of the equity interests of data. The purchase consideration comprised cash of 600 million. At acquisition, the fair value of the NCI was 395 million. Traveller wishes to use the full goodwill method. Well, that is they're measuring the NCI at fair value. On the 1st of December 2016, the fair value of the identifiable net assets was 935 million, and the retained earnings of data were 299 million, and other components of equity were 26 million. The excess in fair value is due to non depreciable land. On the 30th of November 2017, Traveller acquired a further 20% interest in data for a cash consideration of $220 million. Right, aha. So let's go back to our requirement, discuss with suitable calculations. And let me now ask you this instead, not discuss suitable calculations how the consolidated statement of financial position should be prepared but discuss with suitable calculations how the change in ownership on the 30th of November 2017 should be accounted for does that make sense discuss with suitable calculations how the change in ownership in data on the 30th of November should be accounted for yeah does that make sense and is it something we could do? Is it something we could do? And let's think about it. So I'm asking you, the question I'm now gonna to phrase to you is, discuss with suitable calculations how the change in ownership on the 30th of November 2017 should be accounted for, okay? Is that something that we could do? Well, what I'm thinking about is this in terms of a discussion. It appears that on the 1st of December 2016, the acquisition of the 60% equity interest in data gains control for Traveller. Therefore, that is the point of acquisition. And from that point onwards, as Traveller has full control, they will recognize 100% of the net assets of data. They will recognize, at least initially, an NCI of 40% in the net assets data, and they will calculate the goodwill arising on acquisition. Does that make sense so far? Does that make sense so far? Just listen to what I'm saying. Does that make sense so far? It appears that the gaining of control acquire it appears that the gaining of control occurs on the 1st of December 2016 with the acquisition of the 60% interest in data. As a result of that, at the point of gaining control, Traveller therefore needs to recognise within the consolidated statements the goodwill arising on acquisition, 100% of the net assets of data, and the non-controlling interest at that point of 40%. Are we okay so far? I think we are. On the 30th of November, the acquisition of the further 20% represents an increase in the ownership of the net assets of data only. There is no change in control, i.e. the group ownership of net assets and goodwill, because we are dealing with the full goodwill policy. The acquisition of the further 20% results in a greater share of the net assets and goodwill for traveler and a less ownership 
in the net assets and goodwill for the NCI. There is purely and simply a movement in equity to reflect the transaction here, which results in either a negative or positive movement in equity, and there is no gain or loss. What do you think about that, please? There is no gain or loss. We never recognize a gain or loss when there is either a step up or a step down. We only recognize a gain or loss if we gain control or if we lose control. Does that make sense? The acquisition of the further 20% on the 30th of November 2017 literally represents a pure transfer of net assets and goodwill from the NCI to the group. This results in a movement in equity only. Right, you're seeing this, I think. Good, good. Now, all I've done here, all I've done is I've just, just done a little bit of a discussion, and it might be a greater discussion. I'm just trying to get us into the mindset of this. And then let's think about the workings that we need here. Let's think about the workings that we need. So we've got a, we've got a step. Let me go back to the ruler here. We've got a step up situation. Now, remember what is happening. We've got a step up and literally we've got a transfer of net assets and goodwill from the NCI to the group. Net assets and goodwill. Now, let's think about the figures that we need, the figures that we need at the point of this change. What figures do we need at the point of the change? Let's think about it. Let us think about it. Let us think about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, what I'm going to do, here, and you can agree with me or disagree with me here, but what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to look at the net assets of data, the net assets of data, and the first thing I want to do is I want to look at the net assets of data at the point of acquisition. OK. And to be honest, you must remember this, please. You must remember this. You need to think of moving away from any process driven uh, situation that you've looked at before and literally think about what figures do I need now to back up my discussion? Well, let's look at this, please. The share capital of data, the share capital of data is made up of ordinary share capital. Let's have a look at it. We've got share capital of 600. Yeah, I think that's right. At the point of acquisition, we've got uh, retained earnings. Let me put that here, retained earnings of 299, retained earnings of 299, and we've got OCE, other components of equity, of 26. I hopefully we're all happy with those figures there. And you'll notice, you'll notice, can we just quickly add those up? Because we've got 600, we've got 299, and we've got 26 which is a figure of 925. But you'll notice that the fair value of the net assets and acquisition is 935. The net assets and acquisition is 935. So what's the difference, everybody? What is the difference here? What is the difference? What is the difference? What is the difference? Ab absolutely right, everybody. We've got a fair, fair, oh, I don't know why that's not working, a fair value adjustment, and it is to do with land. It is to do with land, and that is a fair value adjustment of 10. Right. Now, what I, the reason I want to do this partly as well is because I want you to see that there could be many, many, many different questions that the examiner could ask you just looking at this first note here. Now, what I now want to do is to look at the net assets at the reporting date. So let me abbreviate that, please, the reporting date, because the reporting date is the date on which this step up occurs. So the share capital is still 600. 
The retained earnings are now 442. Other components of equity is 37. And it doesn't give us any indication of whether the land has been sold or is changing value. So I'm going to take it as read that that is also going to be 10. And can you just give me that figure, please? Does anybody want to give me a little calculation? So 600 plus 442 plus 37 plus 10 is a figure of 1089. 1089. And obviously that means, let me just um, move this across here. That means, of course, that we've got a, a movement here of, let's just put a, another column, a movement here of 143, and we've got a movement there of uh, 11, and importantly, of course, that means that we've got a movement here of 154 between the date of acquisition and the date on, on which this movement from uh, 60% to 80% occurs. Okay, now, very good, everyone. I've got your figures. Thanks a lot. Now, okay, who owns that 154? That movement to 154? Well, of course, it's partly owned by the group and it's partly owned by the NCI. And we're trying to find, we're trying to find what happens at the point of this change of 20%. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the NCI calculation. So here's a separate working for the non-controlling interest. And you don't have to agree 100% with what I'm doing here. What you do have to be happy with is the ability to discuss what is going on and the ability to then back it up with numbers, however you want to do it, where that is required. So what I'm going to do is to say this. OK, let's go back to data. Let's have a look at the NCI with relation to data because we have an original value for the NCI, original value for the NCI, the original value for the NCI. And if we go back to the question, the original value for the NCI, uh, what's the figure? Where's the figure in the question? Let's make sure we highlight these, please. Um, and it looks to me as if the fair value of the NCI, the fair value of the NCI is 395. Very good, 395. Thanks, everyone. OK, Regina says, let's take a break. I respond and say, let's take a break once we've done this. OK, now, what I'm going to say is this post acquisition, post acquisition movement, post acquisition movement. Now, what is the post acquisition movement? Of course, the post acquisition movement is 154, 154. Now, what is the share of that? movement that is owned by the NCI. What is the share of that 154 that is owned by the NCI? What do you reckon? And of course, it is 40%. Absolutely right. It is 40%. So let us put this figure in here. 154 times uh, 40%. And that is a figure of, let's just make that 62. And I have to say what uh, because your exam is marked on principles here, because your exam is marked on principles, this is where the really, really important figure is, please. 40%. It's not 20%. It's 40% because that is what the NCI owns from the beginning, from the point of acquisition through to this point of the step up. So we've now got a situation where we've got a figure of 7, 9 and 6 is uh, 15, 457. We've got a situation that... At the point of the step up, this further 20%, the NCI is being carried at 457. And then, of course, we've got this shift. And I'm going to put another line in here, which is to say transferred, transferred, transferred to the group, transferred to the group. And remember, we're picking, we're transferring from the NCI to the group a percentage of net assets and goodwill. And I'm going to pick up the figure of 457 and I'm going to multiply it by. Multiply it by what, please? Multiply it by what? Multiply it by what? Multiply it by what? Jodian says 20 over 40. Anybody got any different answers? 20 over 40. Amna says 50% because it's 20 over 40. 
20 over 40 of the course is 50 percent very very good we multiply it by the percentage that is changing and divide it by the original size of the NCI 20 over 40 so 20 percent over 40 percent which of course is if you like 50 percent and I'm going to make that 229 of the a decimal point let's round it up 229 brackets or no brackets everybody brackets or no brackets brackets or no brackets brackets or no brackets Vicky says brackets and I absolutely agree with you brackets 229 and of course that leaves us now with a balance on the NCI relating to data of 220 I'm not concerned about that but what I'm concerned about is this please do you add, what's the bookkeeping entry for that 229? What is the bookkeeping entry for the 229? 229, what is the bookkeeping entry for the 229? Well, what if I was to say to you this, please? It is debit NCI, debit NCI, and it is a credit, debit NCI, the NCI is going, is a credit to OC. E, a credit to OCE. Ali says an increase in OCE. I agree with you. Now, please remember this, please. Please remember this. This is not presented within OCI because if you present it within OCI, you are therefore saying it is either a gain or a loss. There is no gain or loss when you have a step up or a step down. You only have gains and losses when you gain control and when you lose control. Does that make sense, please? You only have a gain or loss when you either gain control or you lose control. OK, so the debits and credits are debit NCI credit OCE. It is not presented within OCI. Right now, let's finish this off then and let's look at OCE. OCE, because you're not going to get your increase in 20 percent for nothing. There is going to be consideration paid for this. And if we go back to the question, tell me, please, how much how much was paid by Traveller to acquire the further 20 percent? How much was paid by Traveller to acquire the further 20 percent? It was 220 million, says Jody, and I agree with you. So I'm going to put here consideration. Consideration. And I'm going to put this in brackets, consideration of 220 and you could say credit the bank and debit OCE, credit the bank and debit OCE. And then I'm going to put a little little line here transferred. Transferred from the NCI, transferred from the NCI. And the figure here we know is 228, which is we've just said debit the NCI credit OCE. And we now have a figure here of eight. OK, now this is all occurring within OCE, not retained earnings, but within OCE. And my question now, please, to everyone, my question, please, is this. How are you wanting to describe this figure of eight? How are you wanting to describe this figure of eight? What do you want to call it? What do you want to call it? Because I, this is where we are going to get good marks in the exam for this sort of thing. How do you want to describe this figure of eight? We've paid, travellers paid out 220 million in order to gain two, or not 228, sorry, I've got that, put that figure wrong. That should be 29, of course. Let me go back here, apologies for that. 229, that's a figure of nine. So, traveller paid 220 in order to effectively receive 229 from the NCI. Yes, it is an adjustment to equity, but Tasnin is absolutely right here. It is a it is a positive, it is a positive movement. It is a positive movement in equity. Please do not call it again. Please do not call it a gain because a gain can only occur. Please do not call it a gain because a gain can only occur when either you gain control or you lose control. Now, some of you are saying here, some of you are saying, some of you are saying this is a 
a bargain purchase. Please remember this. Please remember this, everybody. You only calculate goodwill once. You only de-recognize goodwill once. You only calculate goodwill once when you gain control in accordance with IFRS 10. You only de-recognize the goodwill once when you lose control in accordance with IFRS 10. Does that make sense, please? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Right. So let's go back here, please. You're not recalculating goodwill. All you are doing, all you are doing is saying now more of the goodwill and more of the net assets are owned by the group rather than the non-controlling interest. We can't recognize any gain or loss on the change because there is no low losing or gaining of control. We just compare the consideration versus what has been transferred and we have a movement in equity. OK, so let me change the figures. Are we OK with that? Are we OK with what we've done here? Are we OK with what we've done here? OK. Now, let me ask you this, please. Let me say, what would you do if I now said this? Let me change the question and make it that the consideration, let's get rid of this full stop. Let's imagine that the consideration is 239. 239. What do you now want to do? What do you now want to do, everybody here? What do you now want to do? What would you now want to do? Right, Vicky said negative movement, and I say we've got a figure here, we've got a figure here of 10, and that seems to me to be a very good, Vicky, that seems to be to be a negative, a negative movement in equity, yeah, and that of course would be in brackets, yes, do you agree with that? Do you agree with that? Very good, everybody. And please remember, this is not affecting retained earnings. This is not being presented in P and L. This is not being presented in OCI. It is literally a shift in equity between the NCI and OCE, resulting in either a positive or negative movement in OCI. In, so I've, I've said OCI, a negative or positive movement in equity. It is not presented within OCI. Are we OK, please? Because I'm going to change this before we have a break. Are we OK? Are we OK? Right. Now, Traveller acquires control of data on the 1st of December 2016 through the acquisition of the 60% interest. Therefore, at that point in time, in the group accounts, Traveller immediately recognises 100% of the net assets, the NCI of 40%, and the goodwill, which is calculated on the full method, which means that the NCI is basically at its fair value. At the 30th of November 2017, at the 30th of November 2017, the shift of 20% gives Traveller a further interest, an increased interest in the net assets and goodwill. There is no change in control. Therefore, therefore, the movement is reflected as either a positive or movement, positive or negative movement within equity. The NCI is reduced by the amount that is transferred to the group. Based on the above, the following figures would be relevant. And what I've now done is I've done a little bit of discussion backed up by workings that I think are necessary in order to show the markers that I can apply, I can apply the principles, which is that once you gain control, there is no gains or losses recognized until you lose control of that subsidiary company with respect to shifts in ownership between the group and the NCI. Okay, now, I think we're okay with that. I'm, before we have a little break, please, I'm going to ask you this. I'm going to ask you this. It's a good question from Tasneen, which is this, and it's a question to all of you. What if the goodwill was impaired? What if the goodwill was impaired on the 31st of October 2017? Okay, so we've not calculated the goodwill, but I just want you to think about this. 
what would you do if the goodwill that that necessarily would be calculated what would you do if the goodwill was impaired and it was impaired on the 31st of october well obviously we would need to calculate the goodwill and the goodwill impairment would be allocated between the group and the nci please tell me please tell me if the goodwill was impaired on the 31st of october if the goodwill was impaired on the 31st of october what percentage of the impairment will be allocated to the group if the goodwill was impairment tested on the 31st of november 31st of october 2017 what percentage of the impairment will be allocated to the group jody is saying 60 percent Vicky's saying 60 percent Letitia's saying 40 percent crystal saying 60 percent okay everybody look at this please i promise you're going to have a break in a minute but i'm very very keen to look at this look at this word look at this word everybody whoops look at the mess i'm making <laughs> look at the mess i'm making here everybody right look at this look at this goodwill was impairment tested after the additional acquisition in data on the 30th of November 2017. Now, I appreciate that we've not calculated goodwill. We don't need to for what I was trying to get across here, but what percentage of the impairment would be allocated to the group based on what you've read here? Amna says 80%. Is that correct? Is it 60% or is it 80%? Is it 60% or is it 80%? Abdullah says 80%. Fajana says 80%. Azib says 60%. Azib, let's think again. Tasneem says 80%. Aman says 60%. All right, everybody, please, 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 please. I'm going to ask you this again. What would be the percentage of the impairment? charged to the group if the goodwill was impaired impairment tested and the impairment occurred on the 31st of october what would be the percentage to be allocated to the group if it was impairment tested on the 31st of october what would be the percentage please what would be the percentage if it was impaired on the 31st of october 60 percent right 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 now let's go back to the question we have in front of us goodwill was impairment tested after the additional acquisition in data on the 30th of november 2017 based on that what would you now discuss as the amount to be allocated to the group what would be the allocation percentage to the group based on the impairment testing occurring on the 30th of November after the additional acquisition in data. Oh, it's no longer 60%. It, of course, is, ah, oh, you lot are fantastic. It, of course, is 80%. Right. Right, let's have a discussion of this. The principle is that the impairment, the goodwill, the, the impaired, goodwill the impairment is allocated the impairment is allocated between the group and the nci based upon the percentage of the net assets that they hold at the point in time that the goodwill is actually impaired okay the allocation of the impairment loss for goodwill is based upon the percentage of the net assets that are owned by the owning parties at that relevant point in time. So therefore, after the additional acquisition in data on the 30th of November, Traveller no longer owns 60%, it now owns 80%, and therefore the impairment loss is allocated 80% to the group and only 20% to the NCI. Do you agree with what I've just said? Do you agree with what I've just said? Right. And please, everybody, that is the difference between reading through a question and planning a question by reading what the question actually says. OK, 
Now, before we have a break, I've got a quick question from quick question from uh, Sean saying I don't understand where two three nine came from. Sean, basically, remember I, all I did was I just quickly quickly changed the question uh, to see what your response would be if it was a consideration of two three nine and not uh, two two nine. So let me change it to what it is, of course, which is a figure of two hundred and twenty which is giving us a positive movement a positive movement in equity okay and i know that's a bit rough so there is the answer very good everybody let's take a break here please and let's be back at 7 15 so i'm going to write this up so break uh back please at 7 15 that's 10 minutes just let that sink in and discuss it in your mind please about what we've done and I'll see you back in 10 minutes.
Okay, everybody, are we all back? Are we, are we back or are we everyone here? Just give me a quick uh, yes if we're there and the sound is coming through. Brilliant. Very good. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Amna says you can also take a break. That is very, very kind of you, Amna. That is <laughs> uh, that's making me laugh. I had a very, very quick break. I, I got a cup of tea very quick and <laughs> I'm ready to go. That's really made me chuckle. Thank you for that. Now then, um, I'm going to go back over. Um, Cindy just asked me to go back over something and I want to make this perfectly clear because part, part of the reason why I'm doing this is to really... Um, get into your mindset the significance of actually reading through the question properly that you have in front of you because it could make the very very big difference um, to you and it's clearly what the examiner um, is looking for you to demonstrate so let's go back and I ask you I said to you look oh by the way I've calculated the goodwill here but um, I'll come back to that in a minute my question was actually it doesn't matter let's stick down here let's imagine um, I've I've calculated. Let me let me start again. I've got the goodwill calculation in, in front of us now, um, and you don't need to worry too much about the figures per se. But based on the figures in the question, we've got consideration of 600 at the point of acquisition. We've got the fair value of the NCI. We've got the net assets that we calculated, uh, and there they are back at their 935, of course. And so there's a goodwill uh, figure there of 60. Now. My question, what I was trying to get across to you, maybe I didn't do it very well, is let's imagine the impairment, the impairment of the goodwill, the impairment of the goodwill is, uh, let's make it 50. To be honest, I know it's 50 from the question. And that leaves, of course, a carrying amount for the balance sheet of 10. Now, my point, what I was trying to get across to you here was, Obviously, this impairment needs to be allocated between the group, i.e. we charge retained earnings and a charge to the NCI. Now, what I was uh, trying to highlight, more to do with the significance of the question, is let us imagine that the impairment test occurs on the 31st of October. Well, how much does the group own of the goodwill at the 31st of October and how much does the NCI own of that goodwill at the 31st of October? I've just made up the impairment of 50, by the way, uh, Amnath. I've just made up uh, the 50. It, I know it is 50. Uh, we don't need to go through the working of that at the moment. But of course, in answer to my question, if the impairment test occurred on the 31st of October, then the split would be 60-40, wouldn't it? 60-40, yeah? Because it's point in time. It's point in time. So the group would take 60% and the NCI would take uh, 40%. Now, if we go back to the reality of the question, which is that the impairment, the impairment occurs the impairment, let's say still 50, but the impairment occurs on the 30th of November, but not any point on the 30th of November. It's after, it is after the transfer of 20% from the NCI to the group. So therefore the allocation of the impairment charge is not going to be 60-40, but it's going to be 80-20. That's the point. And it's purely and simply based on reading the question properly and identifying the principle, which, which is impairments are something that occur at a point in time. Profits are occurring, if you like, over time. But an impairment test, an impairment calculation is something that occurs at a point in time. And that point in time is after the increased ownership for Traveller of the 20 percent. Are we OK with that? Are we OK with that? And I say the reason I want you to be happy with this is not purely and simply because of uh, what we're doing here in this little question, but to really, really, really get your mind thinking about I need to read the questions very, very carefully. OK, you need to be very, very clear. And I, I obviously work with a lot of students and I think it's very, very important, especially in this exam and maybe more important even than P2, is that we get a balance between obliterating the paper with highlight pen. Is that something we've done? Highlight pen everywhere and not doing any sort of preparation. It is important in the time that you have that you underline words that are really, really important. And I think the word after 
is important here because it clearly is the difference between 60 and 80 okay now we don't need to worry about the impairment charge I am just giving you that figure so that we can just think about um, think about how that would be allocated but please remember please remember uh, that the impairment occurs at a point in time now let's just take this a little bit further forward please because remember as we said yesterday goodwill is only impaired if the cash generating unit to which the goodwill has been allocated is itself impaired so that might be something that we need to discuss but what i want you to do please is this what i want to do what i want you to do please is this and you've now you're sending me quite a few questions on goodwill and i know that goodwill is one of those issues that can um, potentially causes um, problems so what I want to do please is this I'm going to ask you the question which is because you've asked it to me what is the basic difference between the policy for the NCI being fair value or the policy being partial I'm oh, sorry not partial proportion let me change that proportionate okay now what is basically the difference because i want you to in effect look at this question and identify the policy for the nci identify the policy for the nci and then think about what the difference would be if the policy was proportionate okay so what is first of all what is the policy in this question by the way what is the policy for the nci in this question what is the policy for the NCI in this question? Yes, yeah, clearly, it's clearly fair value, isn't it? Because the goodwill is being measured on the full goodwill method. So you're absolutely right, it is fair value. Now, what is then the difference between a question where the policy for the NCI is fair value and a question where the policy for the NCI is proportionate? What is basically the difference? Can you give me one word, one word that sums up the difference? Can you just give me one word that you could use to sum up the difference between a policy for the NCI or fair value versus a policy for the NCI as being proportionate? Letitia says the word is goodwill. Letitia is giving me the word goodwill. Isra is giving me the word goodwill. And I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right, everybody. Now, please remember this. I'm going to draw you a circle here. I'm going to draw you a circle if my pen will work. I'm going to draw you a circle. That is 100%. That is a policy that where the NCI is measured at fair value. Because where the policy for the NCI is fair value, we calculate the full goodwill. We calculate 100% of the goodwill. Okay? Now let's change this and look what I'm now going to do. Stop. Oh, there's part of this missing. There's part of this missing. And what I've got missing here is a percentage. And I know that what I've now done is I've only partially calculated the goodwill. So let's imagine the situation in this question is not that Traveller wishes to use the full goodwill method, but uses the partial goodwill method. Well, that of course means that the goodwill that we've calculated is only 60%. Yes, we've only calculated the 60% of the goodwill. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yes. Now, if, if, if the policy Let's go back to what we have got in the question. Let's go back to the, what we've got in the question. The policy here is for the NCI to be measured at fair value. So what percentage of the goodwill is being calculated? If the policy is fair value, NCI equals fair value. Please tell me what is the percentage of goodwill that is being recognized? What is percentage of goodwill that is being recognized? What is the percentage of goodwill that is being recognized? It is 100%, isn't it? It is 100%. 100%. Yes, 100%. Oops, let's see if it will work. 100%. Now, if the NCI is being measured at fair value, the goodwill is being fully calculated, which means we calculate 100% of the goodwill. Who owns that goodwill? Well, initially, initially, 
60% of that goodwill you expect to be owned by the group and initially you expect 40% of that goodwill to be owned by the NCI. I have to say it won't work out quite like that, but we'll stick with that for the minute. Now, let us change the policy. Let us change the policy and let's make the policy for the NCI proportionate, okay? What am I now gonna do with this? What am I now gonna do with this? Am I gonna complete the circle or am I gonna stop? Am I gonna complete or am I gonna stop? Am I gonna complete or am I gonna stop? What do you reckon? Yes, stop. I stop and I know that the goodwill that is being calculated is the goodwill arising on our share of the net assets, our share of the net assets, which of course means that when the NCI is being measured using the proportionate policy, the NCI owns, the NCI owns a share, the NCI owns a share of the net assets only. The NCI owns a share of the net assets only i.e. it does not own a share of the gross goodwill. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yes. And so therefore, of course, if the goodwill is impaired, then the only charge, the only allocation of that charge is, of course, to the group because we cannot allocate any impairment losses to the NCI because the NCI does not own a share of any goodwill. Does that still make sense? Does that still make sense? Now, here is a question, please, for you. Here is a question for you, and you might say, not another question. I say, yes, I always ask questions. Right, now, please tell me this, which policy produces the higher goodwill figure which policy produces the higher goodwill figure which policy produces the higher goodwill figure which policy for the nci produces the higher goodwill figure which policy for the nci produces the higher goodwill figure is it fair value or is it proportionate tell me please which policy for measuring the NCI produces the higher goodwill figure? Is it the proportionate or is it fair value? You're all saying fair value. Fair value or proportionate? Of course it is fair value because if the policy is fair value, what percentage of goodwill are we calculating, everybody? If the policy is fair value, what percentage of the goodwill are we calculating? What percentage? Of the, yes, absolutely. It will, of course, be a hundred percent. If we're, if the policy is fair value, then this, of course, becomes a hundred percent. You don't stop. And that becomes fair value. And the NCI now owns a share of net assets and and goodwill. Do we agree with that? Yes, you're saying a hundred percent. Right. OK. So let me ask you this question, please. Under which policy will the NCI be a higher figure? Under which policy will the NCI be a higher figure? Proportional to fair value. Which policy produces the larger figure for the NCI? Proportional to fair value. Right, fair value, fair value, right. Very good, everybody. Under which policy, under which policy will the impairment charges be greater? Under which policy will the impairment charges be greater, proportionate or fair value? Right, fair value, of course. If the goodwill is higher under the fair value policy, then the impairment charges will be higher under the fair value policy because we're calculating the impairment not on our share of the goodwill, but on 100% of the goodwill. Yes, does that make sense? And these are important questions for us in the exam please discuss with suitable calculations how goodwill would change if the policy was proportionate now this is what i want you to think about please because i'm going to leave you i'm going to leave you not now you can't get rid of me yet but i'm going to leave you with a couple of questions to think about overnight okay and i want you to think about this please let me write let me uh, write this down for you okay so you don't need to okay 
Question number one. Now remember, I've given you the goodwill figure here. You can refer back to this. I've given you a goodwill figure of 60 based on the fair value policy. Okay, I'm going to ask you this question. How would the initial how would the initial goodwill figure change? How would the initial goodwill figure change if the policy, if the policy for measuring goodwill, if the policy for measuring goodwill was partial? And of course, partial equates to a policy for the NCI of proportionate. I don't want you to do this now, please. I want you to think about this overnight. How would the initial goodwill figure change if the policy for measuring, oops, sorry, let's put a measuring goodwill, apologize, if the policy for measuring the goodwill was partial. Does that question make sense, everybody? Does that question make sense? I know I've made a bit of a hash of writing it down for you, but does that question make sense? OK. Right. How would the initial goodwill figure change? I don't want you to think about grossing it up. I want you to think about how what would the goodwill be if the policy in this question was partial? That's what I want you to think about overnight. OK. And the second question I want you to think about is this, please. Again, I need to do that. I keep forgetting to do that. How would. the change in ownership how would the change in ownership be accounted for how would the change in ownership be accounted for how would the change in ownership be accounted for if the policy if the policy for the NCI was proportionate, okay? Now, what I'm doing here is wanting to get you into a mindset of moving away from maybe a process-driven exercise that you might have had before, okay? Um, please, I'm, I'm not, as we do this, I'm not saying that the you can change your mind as to what the policy is. I am literally just wanting you to think about a situation if, if you had to calculate something where the policy was not proportion, was not fair value, but was proportionate. Is that clear, please? I'm not saying that a company can just wake up one morning and say, oh, we're going to now change the policy. I'm just wanting you to think about how your figures would change if I amended the question. Is that clear, please? I need to make sure that everybody's happy with what I'm trying to get across here. I just want you to do some recalculations. Now, thank you, everybody. Remember what you've told me. You've said, well, let's let's just let's just confirm a few things. Goodwill is only calculated once at the point of acquisition. It is only de-recognized once at the point of losing control, a disposal, okay? If the goodwill is impaired, the allocation is between the group and the NCI based upon the percentages that they own of that goodwill, sorry, the percentages they own of the net assets. Now, the, the significance is based upon the policy because if the policy, if the policy for the NCI is if the policy for the NCI is fair value, then we calculate 100% of the goodwill, i.e. we call it the full goodwill method. And any impairment is allocated between the group and the NCI based upon their ownership of the net assets at the point in time of the impairment test. If the policy is proportionate, then the NCI does not own any of the goodwill, i.e. it only owns a share of the net assets. And therefore, if the goodwill is impaired, the impairment loss is charged purely and simply to the group retained earnings. Is that OK? Because I think that's what you've been telling me via the Q&A slate. Now, 
All I'm asking you to do then, please, is to think about how the goodwill figure would change, the figure that we've got here, how that goodwill figure would change if the policy was proportionate, i.e. partial, because partial is the same as proportionate, partial goodwill, proportionate NCI, full goodwill, fair value for the NCI, and more significantly, how would you account for the step up if the policy for the NCI is proportionate? How would you account for the step up? Let's go back up here. How would you account for this that we've done? Yeah, how would you account for this if the policy was not for the NCI to be at fair value, but if it was proportionate? Okay. Will you have a look at that, please, overnight? Will you have a think about that overnight? And you might need to refer back to the recording to look at the figures. But remember, remember, the fair value policy produces a higher goodwill figure, it produces a higher impairment charge, and it produces a higher NCI, purely and simply because of that one word that you told me, purely and simply because of that one word, which, of course, is goodwill. Okay, so I'm asking you just to have a think about that tonight and we will revisit that tomorrow in our final session as we, when we start. And what I don't want you to think about is purely and simply this, please. How would this figure here change? And how would, how would these figures here change, change if the policy for the NCI was proportionate based on your understanding, based on what you've told me, about the difference between partial and, and uh, well, proportionate and fair value. That's what I'm asking, please. Now, what I want to, um, what I want you to be aware of, please, is this: we have looked at one part of a question here, and we need to be in the mindset of being able to identify issues within the consolidation. Yeah, and so therefore, we need to be happy going into the exam knowing about when control occurs what is a disposal what is the difference between proportionate and fair value what happens when uh, goodwill is impairment tested and there is an impairment charge what happens if we move from 60 to 70 percent or 70 to 60 percent for example okay remember that you can only recognize a gain or loss when there is either an acquisition or there is a disposal Anything else just results in a shift in equity because all we're doing is moving from the NCI to the group in terms of net assets and goodwill if the policy is fair value or the other way. Now, let's think about this, please. Let's think about this. I'm going to make some figures up here. And what I want to do is I want to go back to the situation we had earlier, which is A, investing in B. A, investing in B. Okay. And in year one, in year one, A acquires 40% of the equity of B, okay? Now, all things being equal, all things being equal, what do you think is the likely treatment for that investment in B for the financial statements of A in that first year? What do you think is the likely treatment? How do you think? All things being equal. Yes, Bicky says it depends. I do agree with you. But in law likelihood, what do you think is going to be the uh, the typical accounting? The typical accounting. Yeah, and I think you're right. I think I think it is likely to be an associate and is likely to be the equity method. I accept that. I accept that. Very good, everybody. The likelihood is associate. But remember, we're not going to assume. Now, let's go on to year two. Let's go on to year two. And in year two, A acquires a further mm, 25%. A acquires a further 25%. Now, in all likelihood, in all likelihood, what do you now want to do? What do you now believe is the correct treatment for the investment that A has in B? What do you think about that? Right. It now looks like in all likelihood it is a subsidiary company because we have on the face of it, gained control. So we've got 65%. Now, okay, fantastic. Now, please tell me, please tell me this, please tell me this. Upon acquisition, upon acquisition, what is A 
immediately going to be recognizing now in the group accounts upon acquisition. Okay, what are the things that A is immediately going to be recognizing in the group accounts upon acquisition? Right, so Kate is saying the NCI, and presumably the NCI is 35%. Yes, yeah, some of you are saying goodwill. Chris is saying goodwill, net assets, yeah. What if I said to you this, please? What if I said to you this? What if I said to you goodwill? What if I said to you NCI? What if I said to you net assets? Would you agree with that? Upon acquisition, this is immediately what is going to be recognized in the group accounts. Three things, the goodwill, the NCI, and the net asset. Do you agree with that? Do you agree with that? Just give me a quick uh, nod, yes or no. Right, I'm seeing a yes here. Good. All right. Now, the percentage for the goodwill, what is going to be the percentage? What goodwill will we calculate? Well, that will depend upon the policy, won't it? That will depend upon the policy, whether the policy, whether the policy is going to be partial, i.e. proportionate, partial, or of course, full. Okay, that depends. Now, what percentage will we recognize for the NCI upon acquisition? What percentage will we recognize for the NCI upon acquisition? Give me your figures, please. I'm just saying 35%, Kate saying 35%, and I, of course, agree entirely with that. 35% upon acquisition, good. Now, everybody, what percentage will, the, will A recognize in the group accounts for the net assets? What percentage of B's net assets will get recognized in those group accounts? Amna's saying 100%, Jodian's saying 100%, Irene's saying depends. So let me go through it again. What percentage of the net assets will A recognize of B? What percentage of B's net assets will A recognize in the consolidation immediately upon acquisition? And, and it of course is going to be 100%, not 65%. A owns 65%, but of course has control over 100% of the net assets. Right. Brilliant. Brilliant. Now, of course, hopefully we can see that if there is a change in ownership, but not a loss of control, then we still recognize 100% of the net assets, but we would have a shift in equity to reflect the fact that either we now own more or we own less. OK, that's basically what we've done before. Now, what I want you to think about, please, is this. Let us focus on this here. Let us focus on this here, the goodwill. Anybody who remember basically what and compare? Is it true to say that the principle behind the goodwill calculation is to compare the real value of what the acquirer is prepared to pay against the real value of what actually has been acquired? Is that is that right? Is that does that make sense? The real value of what is being what the acquirer is prepared to pay against the real value of what is being acquired. Yes, it is. And you're all saying yes. And I'm happy with that. And what that means is that if we look within IFRS 3, we know that goodwill is defined as the difference between the fair value of the consideration and the fair value of the identifiable net assets acquired. The difference between the fair value of the consideration and the fair value of the identifiable net assets acquired. There's the calculation. Now, that, of course, means the following, everybody. Let's imagine, let's imagine that immediately before, immediately before the acquisition, this figure here, this, this 40 percent, this uh, associate was being carried at 200 OK, I'm just telling you, I'm just making the figures up that immediately before the acquisition occurred, the associate was being carried at an amount of 200 using, of course, the equity method. But immediately upon acquisition, immediately upon acquisition, this has a fair value, not of 200, but of 250. Which figure is most important to us now, please? Is it 200 or is it 250? Which figure is important to us? Is it 200 or is it 250? And of course, it is 250 because upon acquisition, 
the goodwill is the difference between the fair value of the consideration. The fair value of the consideration is not 200. That was the carrying amount. The fair value of the consideration is now 250. Plus, of course, let's say the consideration for the 25 percent is, I don't know, let's say uh, uh, 150 just to make it up. Now, what I want you to what I want you to be happy. Ah, oh, yes. Crystal says. And so let me take you back here. Let me take you back here. The consideration is not 350 because that is not the fair value. The fair value is 250 and 450, which of course is 400. Now, remember that immediately before the acquisition, the associate was being carried at 200. But upon acquisition, we need to make sure it is fair valued to its fair value of 250. Yes, 250, which means, of course, that upon acquisition, upon acquisition, there is a fair value gain that we need to recognize of 50. Do you, do you agree with me there, everybody? Do you agree with me there? Do you agree? Right. Now, what do you think the double entry is here? Where do you think we're going to credit? Do you think we're going to credit retained earnings or do you think we're going to credit OCE. What do you think? Are we going to credit OCE or are we going to credit retained earnings? What do you think? Yes, because remember, this is going to be a credit, a credit to profit and loss, if you like, oops, if you like retained earnings, retained earnings, because of course, remember, you can only recognize a gain on acquisition or on disposal, everything that occurs in between. If this goes from 65 to 75, then it is purely and simply a movement within equity reflected in other components of equity. Can we see what's happening here? So what I want you to think about, please, is this. Remember that when we have what is called a step acquisition, not a step up, but a step acquisition, where we're gaining control via a cumulative Let's see if that's going to work. A cumulative holding. Remember, because of the requirements of IFRS 3, all of those, all of those, all of those previous shareholdings, in this case, the 40 percent, has to get remeasured to its fair value at the point of acquisition, which will most likely create some gain. And in this case, I'm telling you, I'm giving you, you can see it. It's a gain of 50, which will be presented as a gain within P and L. OK, does that make sense, everybody? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Having to make sure that all of the consideration is at its acquisition date, fair value. OK. Does that make sense? Good, everybody. Now, this is what I want us to finish off with. This is what I'm going to I'm going to switch across very, very quickly to this question called Jockout. Jockout. Now, as a question, is a question that again you've got available to you, and I'm going to go forward quite a long way to the requirements. And this says prepare a consolidated statement of cash flow. Jockout. Are you going to see that in this exam? Are you going to see a requirement that says prepare a consolidated statement of cash flows for the Jockout group? Do you think you'll see that? <laughs> Crystal says nope. Amna says no. And of course, the answer absolutely is no not a full cash flow kate says not a full cash flow but of course it could be a possible requirement to discuss to discuss basic maybe with some calculations elements of that cash flow yes so is it a possibility that you could have a requirement to discuss backed up by suitable calculations elements of the cash flow for example, the cash flows from operating activities or the cash flows from financing or the cash flows from uh, investing activities. Yes, that's a possibility. Good. Now, what I want you to do is what I want us to do together. I really like your thinking, everybody. I think you're really getting into the, the mindset of an SBR. SBR very, very good. Now, what I want to do, please, is to think about we're going to read this through together. This is let's we don't need to worry too much about all the figures here. 
clearly you can see there's a lot of information given to you and this is a p2 question that i've remolded this is not what you will see in your exam but what i want to do as we get to the end of our session today is to look at this oops look at this do you know i'm not very good with this pen am i look at this element here uh let's have a look at this here right okay let's read this through together everybody on the 1st of december 2015 okay that's jock had acquired eight percent of the ordinary shares of tigray and had treated this investment at fair value through profit and loss in the financial statements to the 30th of november 2016 What's the relevant standard there, please? What is the relevant standard? They acquired eight percent and treated this at fair value through PL to the year ended 30th of November 2016. What's the relevant standard? I for S9, yeah, I for S9. Very good. Now, very, very good. Very, very good. It's a financial asset, it's equity, of course. Hey, here's a question for you again, everybody. What's the default measurement? What's the default measurement for investment in equity? Following IFRS 9, what's the default measurement for investments in equity? Investments in equity. I'm just saying P&L. Crystal saying fair value through P&L. Is it fair value through p Yes, absolutely right. Remember, in order to measure the investment in equity at fair value through OCI, you've got to be given information about whether the shares have been held not for trading purposes and that election has been made remember the default is fair value through p l very very good now let's get let's get on with this on the 1st of december 2016 jock had acquired a further 52 percent of the ordinary shares of tigre oh, and gained control of the company hey what happens on the 1st of december what does jock at now have on the 1st of december what does jock at now have on the 1st of December 2016 it has control and it therefore has a subsidiary right so hey what are the three things that Tigre sorry what are the three things that Jocad is now automatically going to have to recognize in the consolidated accounts on the 1st of December 2016 what are the what are the three things that are going to have to be recognized on the 1st of December 2016 it looks to me look to be goodwill NCI net assets. That's right, isn't it? Right. Right. Now, what about the goodwill calculation? Is it based on is it based on old, old costs, old carrying amounts, or is it based on fair values? Is it goodwill calculation for the, the consideration for the goodwill? Is it based on old carrying amounts of consideration or is it based on fair values? What is it going to be? It's fair value. Right. OK. Now, look at this, please. Look at this. The original 8% holding was acquired for 4 million. At the 1st of December 2016, the fair value of the 8% holding in Tigray held by Jockad at the time of the business combination was 5 million. Right. What, what is Jockad going to recognize upon acquisition with respect to this previous holding of 8%. Right. Jockad is going to recognize a gain of a gain of a gain of 1 million, a gain of 1 million. Right. Fantastic everybody. It will recognize a gain, a fair value gain of 1 million. Okay. Now, please tell me this. Where will that gain be presented in PNL or in OCI? Jockat will or would have recognized a gain of 1 million. PL or OCI? PL or OCI? Well, how was the instrument? How was the in instrument measured under IFRS 9? Was it through PL or was it through OCI? And it was through PL, isn't it? So this 1 million will be recognized as a gain of 1 million within PL. Brilliant. Brilliant, everybody. Now, haha. <laughs> Is that 1 million cash flow or not a cash flow? Tell me this, please. That 1 million gain that is going to be recognized, is that a cash flow or not a cash flow? 
Kate says not a cash flow. Vicky says not a cash flow. Abdullah says not a cash flow. Right. OK, so let's now think about our cash flows, because somewhere within here, somewhere within here, somewhere within here, we have that gain of one million. OK, now you remember as well as I do that when we are calculating the cash flows from when we are calculating the cash flows from operating activities, then basically what IS7 says is we have to start off from this figure here and we effectively then going to recalculate that as a cash flow figure. OK, and we'll have a little bit more of a look at this tomorrow. But let's just look at this. Where do you think that one million is? Because clearly it's not to do with profits of the associate. Clearly, it's not to do with gains on property. It's a it's a gain on a financial asset. Clearly, it's not to do with finance costs because it's not it's not a finance cost. It's a gain. Well, oh, it's not. Hey, look, I reckon that one million may we be, may be within that figure of twenty five million. Do you agree with that? Does it look as if that one million gain is going to be included within that twenty five million other income? Right. So hold on a minute. What does that mean we've got to do? What does that mean we've got to do when we're converting this profit figure into cash? Are we going to add back one million or are we going to deduct one million? Add or deduct one million? Add or deduct one million? Right, we're going to deduct it because it is pushing up profits by one million, but it is not a cash flow. Wow. It's pushing up the profits by one million, but it is not a cash flow. And now what you're doing is you are combining your knowledge, your understanding of consolidation with your understanding of how we convert profit figures into cash. I think that is really, really good, everybody. Really, really good. Now, let's finish with this because I'm going to really test you now. Look at this here, everybody. I know we've got three or four minutes left and I'm not going to let a minute go spare. Look at this. Look at this. The fair value of the identifiable net assets of Tigre, excluding deferred tax assets and liabilities at the end of the acquisition. Sorry, at the date of the acquisition comprised the following. The tax base of the identifiable net assets of Tigre was 40 million. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, everybody out there. Does deferred tax have an impact for the group as well as for the legal entity? Do we have to consider deferred tax when we're looking at the group as well as the legal entity? Yes. Hey, look at this, please. 15 plus 18, 33 plus 5, 38 plus cash seems to me to be what? What have we got there as the what have we got as the the net assets? We've got 33. We've got seems to me to be a figure of 45 million, 45 million for the net assets. But the tax base of those net assets is only is only 40 million. Tax base is 40 million. Temporary difference, everyone. We've got two minutes. Is there a temporary difference? There is a temporary difference of five, isn't there? Shall we calculate the deferred tax on that five? Shall we calculate the deferred tax on that five? Will it be a deferred tax liability or a deferred tax asset? You've got two minutes to tell me deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability. Net assets. 45 tax base, 40 taxable temporary difference equals five times the tax rate. 30 percent equals one. Point five. It's a deferred tax liability, everybody. Net assets go down, goodwill goes. 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 See you tomorrow, everybody. I think we're going to run out of our time today, but you're absolutely right. Net assets go down, goodwill goes up. You're now combining your knowledge of consolidation with deferred tax, and you lot are brilliant. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks very much, everybody, for your great participation today. Thank you so much. And I will see you all tomorrow for our final session. Have a lovely evening, everybody. Take care and think, think and think and think again.
And by the way, have a look at that little exercise. <laughs> I'm going now. I promise you I'm going. Have a great evening.